Okay, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the first NAEP SDP webinar of 2018. I'm really excited. We have lots of people on the line with us today. And so um, I'd like to give a brief, my name is Marina Denny, by the way. Sorry, I'm with Mississippi State University. And we're gonna be hosting all of the NAEP, NAEP SDP webinars this year. Um, I would like to do a brief overview of our organization for any of the non-members that might be joining us today or folks that might be not familiar with what we do. So we are the newest JSEP organization, Joint Council of Extension Professionals organization. We're somewhere around seven years old, so relatively new. And our official term or title is the National Association of Extension Program and Staff Development Professionals, which is why NAEPSTP is a lot easier to say and write out. Um, so we are kind of the home for folks that didn't typically have a program area specialty. So extension specialists or uh, faculty or agents or educators that are working on things like program development, evaluation, staff development. And then we also are a home for folks that are dealing with technology in extension, communication in extension. So we're kind of like a hodgepodge, but really do uh, evaluation program development and staff development. So I would invite you if you are not already a member or you're not familiar with us to visit our website and that was uh, on that cover screen that was there for a little bit but it's naepsdp.org. Um, I would also invite you to consider attending our annual conference which we have every year in December. This year it's going to be December 11th through the 13th in Arlington, Virginia. And, um, and then if you'd like, consider becoming a member, because we feel like we have a lot to offer to all of our JSEP members, um, regardless of your, of your particular program area. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenter for today. I'm really excited to introduce Danae Wolf. She is an education, educational technology specialist with The Ohio State University Extension Service. She has graciously agreed to share her expertise with us today on how to optimize PowerPoint as an educational and communication tool with our clients. So um, just so that everybody knows, they are automatically muted as you have joined in to participate with us today. But if you want to ask questions or give comments, I know Danae is going to make this uh, interactive. There is a chat box option. If you look at the bottom of your screen or maybe mouse over the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a Q&A box and so if you click on that or I'm sorry a chat box it, you'll you'll be able to type your your questions or comments in and I will be moderating um, uh, moderating those as best as possible so uh, if we could at least get that started um, Danae is interested to know and so am I where you're joining us from so if you wouldn't mind uh, typing into the chat box what universities you're representing that would be cool just to get a feel for who's who's on right now because we have 79 attendees currently signed on so i'm really excited about that okay so with that i'm going to turn it over to danae and stop talking and let her take take the show all right thanks marina um can you confirm that you can hear me okay okay wonderful um i'm seeing people from all over the place which is wonderful north carolina sunny and warm can't say the same for Ohio, unfortunately, although yesterday it was, no, Tuesday, I think it almost got up to 70 here in Ohio, which is crazy um, and awesome. So I'm seeing people from all over the nation here joining us today. I am super excited to offer this presentation on PowerPoint to you today. I'm hoping that you guys are gonna walk away with some really good actionable tips and tricks to use when you use PowerPoint from, from here on out. The first thing, so I, I see some of you guys are still typing into the chat box um, where you're from. I am also curious to know, when was the last time you walked away from a presentation and thought, aside from how great the presenter may have been, you thought, wow, that slide deck was simply amazing. And what was it about the slide deck that you really enjoyed? So just spend a, a few seconds um, thinking about that. Also, um, if you, I'm trying to think if you guys should all have access in the chat box. If you want to send um, a chat to the panelists, you should be able to do that. I think you should also be able to choose all panelists and attendees, but I might be mistaken on that. I don't know if you guys have the attendee option. I see most of you guys are just typing to panelists. Oh, no. Okay, so you do. So yeah, so when you type that, make sure that you guys are, are opting to send it to everybody so that we can all see 
um, we can all see. So yeah, if you have a, a, an example in your head of the last time that you walked away from a, a presentation thinking that the slide deck, what you saw up um, displayed on the screen was absolutely amazing, what was it? What was it about it that you really enjoyed seeing? Some people were saying the photos made the presentation come alive, data visualization. So I'll give you guys just a few words and appropriate graphics. Yes, we'll be talking about that. <laughs> stories, stories and pictures, interactive points with audience. Okay incorporating video clips, that's another really great one. So a lot of people are pretty much saying the exact same thing. Few words, lots of, of, of um, either graphics or charts or, or data and storytelling. So that's what we're gonna be talking about here today. I am going to share my PowerPoint presentation with you. And as I share this, I don't think I can see the chat box anymore. So Marina's gonna be um, watching for the chat box to make sure that I don't miss anything coming through. So we're gonna be talking about um, designing PowerPoint presentations for true impact today. And it, you know, as, as I was reflecting on what I wanted to share late last night as I was unable to sleep, I thought this is kind of, it's, it's a really cool opportunity to teach about PowerPoint because PowerPoint is probably the one tool with which almost every extension professional is very, very familiar, right? We've been using PowerPoint for literally decades. In fact, I learned PowerPoint when I was in middle school. So I've been using it for a really, really long time. We've all been using it for a really long time, but I think we could probably also admit that many of us don't always use it really well. So we're gonna be talking about how we can use PowerPoint a little bit better. Um, I'm gonna start here by, by talking about death by PowerPoint. I'm gonna see if I can pull up the, the chat box. So when you, when you hear the phrase um, death by PowerPoint, what do, you, what do you think of? You probably have some images in mind of the last time you sat in a, a presentation and you just thought, wow, this is not, not really great. Yeah, Z, boring, sleeping, many slides, lots of words. Probably something that comes to mind is having a presenter just read line by line by line. Um, I have I have seen that. So everybody is pretty much saying the exact same thing. Too many words on your slide. And sometimes that makes sense, right? If you are, if you're reading, for example, a long quote from somebody and you want to make sure that you know that quote, you can put the entire quote up on the slide. It makes sense to have um, a lot of rules or a lot of words on that. <clears throat> so as I think back to some of the, the PowerPoint presentations that I've given before, that is PowerPoint presentations about creating and delivering PowerPoint presentations. Um, I'm kind of horrified by the, the general rules that I was teaching people. And I was teaching Master Gardener volunteers specifically. How do you create a great PowerPoint presentation? And I followed this, this rule, which used to be considered, I think, a best practice, which was the five by five by five rule. And some of you may have, have heard of this before. Um, it, it basically said, you should have no more than five lines of text on a slide, no more than five words per line of text, and no more than five text heavy slides in a row. And when I think of that, I think, wow, that just that doesn't sound great, right? That sounds really, really boring. And that sounds like, like exactly like death by PowerPoint. Um, very, very wordy, not a lot of great um, graphics. So for the, the next little while here, I'm gonna be sharing some tips and tricks on how to improve the use of your PowerPoint presentation. The format that I'm doing for this is I'm gonna show you seven tips for great slide design. And a lot of this is gonna kind of talk about graphic design principles, but I'm not going to get overly technical because I understand many of you are not graphic designers. Some of you probably have a big interest in graphic design, um, but many extension professionals are not graphic designers and we shouldn't expect them to be. Um, so I'm not gonna get super technical encapsulated in everything that I'm going to share today is, is really this underlying, um, this underlying um, I, I guess, tips and tricks on how to just be a better presenter. It's not just about great slide design, great slide design, it's really about being a, a great presenter. So after I get through those seven tips, I'm going to exit out of my, my formal presentation, I'm going to get us into PowerPoint, and I'm going to show you 
some of my, you can call it creative methods if you want, um, just for how I think about creating a, a slide and then hopefully some actionable things that you can take away to say, wow, I, I didn't know I could do that or this is a, you know, something that I can use when I go to create a PowerPoint presentation next. So I'm gonna take one more look. The words go in the notes. Yes, thank you. The words go in the notes section, not the slide. And we will talk about the, the importance of that. I love that. So when I thought about where to put this slide, I wasn't really sure where to put it. Branding is really important. I thought I could, I could say this up front and I can almost hear from all of you the audible sighs and groans and oh, branding, yes, it's important, we know, we get it, because that's what I hear from my colleagues here in Ohio. And I thought maybe I could just put this at like at the very last slide in the, the presentation, almost like an afterthought. The reality is branding cannot be an afterthought because the way, the, the rules in which we have to work for branding at our respective universities largely dictate what we can do and maybe how creative we can get with our presentations, right? We all have certain um, branding guidelines that we have to follow. So the very first thing I wanted to mention is before you start a PowerPoint presentation from a completely blank slate, it's really important to understand from, from what you have to work. So take a look at your university's branding guidelines. Here at Ohio State, we have a style guide all available online. It's a really, really fantastic website. Um, and I'm always a little bit shocked when I talk to colleagues and they're like, I've never even visited that website before. I had no idea that it existed. But it goes over um, the use of our university logos. It goes over the very specific colors we are to use in presentations. Um, we have some other artwork that we can use. And it, it basically outlines how we can use it and more importantly, how we should not be using the university brand. And it's so important to recognize that. In that style guide, we know exactly what fonts we're allowed to use. Um, I mentioned colors. It, it lists the individual color codes because we can't just use any, any color of scarlet, any shade of scarlet. We have a very specific color of, um, of scarlet and gray that we should be using. And this is really important. Um, I get a lot of eye rolls when I talk about, about branding because people say, well, it's just, you know, can I just come up with a color that's close to that? You can, but you know, really branding helps provide that consistency and that brand identity to everything that, that we do. And I think more than ever, this is really important in a digital context because when you create content for a digital world, whether you're posting a slide deck on a website for people or you're sending it to, to people through email or cloud storage services, theft of digital content is a really big deal. Um, it's really easy to just steal other people's materials and put your own branding on it. If you have branding on your materials, it's a little bit more difficult to do that. So I, I think that's one of the, the points of importance for, for branding. So that's tip number one. We got it out of the way. Now let's look at, at some of our other, our other tips. Keep it simple. This is probably, it's probably the easiest, I think, conceptual tip that I can give you is your slides should be really simple. At the same time, I think this is what, what many people, quite frankly, what, what we fail at historically when we think about creating PowerPoints. It's really, really easy to create a slide with paragraphs of text on it. And it's really easy to do that for a, a long list of reasons. Number one, many of us tend to use PowerPoint as our outline for our presentation. And I think you guys should have um, maybe a hand raise feature if you guys can just um, raise your hand. I don't know if I can see that under the participants. Yeah, so raise your hand if you have been guilty of using a, a PowerPoint presentation as your outline, right? So you know I'm, I'm gonna be sure not to forget anything because it's all up there in front of me. So when, when I say keep it simple, I, I can, like I'm not naive to what I'm asking you to do. I, and I know what I'm asking you to do is you have to know your presentation and your content so well that you can get up in front of an audience and you can present the whole thing and maybe not have notes. But here's the thing. Nobody said you don't necessarily get notes, right? I have my entire slide deck printed right here in front of me. I haven't really been looking at it because I haven't needed it yet, but there might, there might come a point that I'm like, oh, I, I don't really remember what I was going to say, or there was something I really wanted to make sure um, I say so I can just glance at my notes and have that, 
have that there for me. So that's what I've been given, um, or that, that's what I've been doing a lot recently when I have these very, very slim, uh, simple slide decks. The other thing, and I think this is one of the biggest excuses that I can imagine getting when we say very, very few words on your, your slide deck, is people, and again, you can use the, the raise hand feature for this, how many of you guys have used your slide deck as the notes that you print and hand to your attendees? I think many, many of us have done that. We tend to do that for conferences, right? We don't produce a, an entirely separate piece of, of content or document with notes that we can give to our attendees. Instead, we have everything available in the, the PowerPoint presentation. We simply save that as notes, we print it, we hand that to our participants. So what can you do a little bit differently? Well, what I would encourage you to do is create your PowerPoint presentation, maybe with as many words as you need to, and then simply copy and paste all of that text into a Word document and use that as the, the outline that you then print and hand to your participants for notes. You're going to have all of that text someplace. You're either going to have it in your PowerPoint presentation, you're going to bore your participants to death, or you're going to have it in a handout that you can say, you know what, guys, you don't have to be frantically writing notes throughout my entire session because I'm going to give you these notes after the, the presentation. So just pay attention to what I'm saying. I think one of the, the best questions that you can ask yourself is think about the presentations that you typically give. Maybe think about the last presentation that you gave or maybe consider a PowerPoint presentation that you've created before that you know broke some of these rules and maybe was really text heavy. And ask yourself this question. If I put my presentation up on a screen and I handed somebody in the audience the clicker, the, the slide advancer, and just had them go through the slides and I walked away and I didn't give the presentation, could my audience have, have gotten pretty much the gist of my entire presentation without even having me give it to them? And if the answer is, yeah, probably, then you really need to think about completely redoing your slides. The reality is you don't want your participants to have everything just from your slide deck, because then what good are you? You're just reiterating what's already in front of them. So think about, think about yourself as being the primary focal point of your slide deck. Without you, your audience would have nothing. You are the thing. Your PowerPoint is not the thing. Your PowerPoint is simply a prop to help maybe illustrate an example or drive a, a point home. Um, if you've ever watched a, a TEDx presentation or a TED Talk, they use their slide decks simply as props, but the presenter is the storyteller. The presenter is the presentation. So think about that next time, next time you um, get in front of PowerPoint to create, to create a slide deck. So I think that's, that's all I wanted to say for, for this slide. Do we have any questions so far? I do see somebody, um, and this is a really, really good point. Diana said, um, in terms of branding, we are often given a template to use. And yes, that is often um, very true. Here at Ohio State, of course, I cannot speak for all of your respective universities. Here at Ohio State, we do have templates that we have been given, um, but we have also been told that you do not have to use these templates necessarily. In your states, that could be different. Um, what we have fallen on here at Ohio is many people just use the templates because they're easy. We don't have to think about um, or worry about branding because it's already been done for us. So what we end up with literally is almost every single person using the exact same template for every presentation. So when we go to annual conference, for example, we look at the same template again and again and again, and it gets a little bit dull um, after a while. So I would encourage you to, to really dig a little bit deeper into your branding guidelines and determine are you really bound to using those those templates? And the answer might be yes. Um, if you're not, think a little bit creatively about how you can still um, be in compliance with your university's brand, but also be a little bit more creative. So hopefully that makes some sense. Here's the big one. Use quality images. Um, images, it's like the number one tip that we think about when we design a PowerPoint is using really, really high quality images. Generally, a lot of people will use the rule of thumb that you should only be using one image per slide. This isn't a hard, fast rule. You may have a situation where you want to put a couple pictures on a slide, 
I would encourage you though to have consistency across the the size and even nitty gritty things like the alignment. Um, one of the things that just because I'm I'm interested in graphic design, one of the things that tends to drive me a little bit bonkers is when I see like just really strange alignment of text boxes or images, or you have an image of one size and then something completely different, and it, it's just not really aesthetically pleasing. Um, so I would encourage you to to think about um, images. Um, somebody asked, where do we access these quality images? And I'm so glad you asked because I have. I have a growing list of stock image sites that I would be happy to uh, to give to all of you. The two websites that I like to use, I have two absolute favorites. Pixabay um, is one that I have been using, and here I'm going to put this in the chat box. Pixabay. Pixabay is one, and StockSnap.io is another one that I really, really like. And I like them for different reasons. Pixabay has a whole host of images. They've been around for a, a little bit longer, I think, than StockSnap. So they have a lot more options available. You can sign up for a free account or you don't even need an account, but then the image downloads are gonna be a little bit lower resolution that you can download. Um, both are absolutely free and both, um, both websites offer only images that have the Creative Commons Zero license, which means that you can download th those photos, you can edit them in any way that you need. You can use them for commercial and non-commercial purposes, including educational purposes, um, and you do not have to provide attribution. So you can use those images absolutely freely, um, and you don't have to worry about anything. There are two wonderful websites. Pixabay has a lot more options available to you. They also have a lot of just kind of garbage images. Um, you can search by actual photos. You can search by illustrations. You can search by vector graphics. So you have different parameters that you can put in there. Um, a word about using illustrations or clip arts in PowerPoint presentations. Let me just ask you this, and maybe you can type into the chat box. What are your guys' general feelings on clip art? <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of, yeah, let the icky. Let, let's not use clip art. Generally, juvenile, do not use. Depends on the content and the audience. Generally is, is what I would say is if you're looking for something humorous or there's like a very, very specific purpose, that you, you want to use clip art for, it can be appropriate. Generally speaking, though, in most professional um, presentations, clip art just tends to be a do not use. Not a hard, fast rule, but kind of a, a general rule. So um, going back to, I'm kind of reading your comments here, not copyright if you're willing to do a little bit more work. Flickr, yeah, so um, Bob said Flickr can be a really good one. Flickr you can use, and there are search parameters that you can um, search for, like uh, different, Creative Commons licenses, so you can make sure that you're not kind of like using Comic Sans. Yes, Marina. <laughs> Comic Sans is a big no-no in the professional world, and we will talk about um, about font type um, here in a, a little while. Um, so yeah, Flickr is another really good resource. Again, I have a growing list on our EdTech blog for Ohio State of different resources that you can use. Um, huge no-no though, and, and this one this one always tends to shock me when I'm talking to my extension colleagues and somebody will say something about how, oh yeah, I just I grabbed that image from a Google image search. Please don't do that. Never do a Google image search and just pull an image without verifying and confirming that you have the rights to use that image because you can get yourself into a whole host of trouble, including lawsuits and major fines for stuff like that. Um, I recently read, it wasn't super recent, maybe last year or the year before, I read an article about a blogger who needed an image of a tomato for her blog post. And she went to Google image search and she said, I knew better. I knew I shouldn't have been doing it, but I was in a pinch. I just needed something quick. I did a Google image search and I found a, a picture of a tomato and I used it. And months later I get a, a lawsuit and she owed, it was like seven or $800 the photographer was able to come back and, and uh, just sue her and say, this is lost damages. You cannot just use any image that you find out there. You have to ensure that you have, um, that you have the rights to use it, which is why I tend to only go to sites like Pixabay and StockSnap.io. Um, and again, there are others. So Pixabay, going back to those two resources, 
Pixabay, one of the things I've realized recently is they have a growing number of just straight up inappropriate images. Um, you do not want to be caught in a situation where you are in your office and you're looking for a stock image of something for a professional presentation and you have really inappropriate photos showing up on your computer. Um, recently though, I've also noticed that they have employed a, um, like a censorship filter. So most of the inappropriate images, they're all covered by like a black box and it says adult content. Click here if you want to actually view it. Um, if you sign up for an account and for some reason that filter hasn't been like put on, you could probably, um, you could probably search for help and figure out how to turn that filter on because yeah, you just don't want to be caught in that awkward situation. Um, I like stocksnap.io. Fewer options probably. You don't have quite, um, quite the, the plethora of images, but super high quality images, super professional images. Um, both are absolutely free, so you can just download them and, and use them. So images, really important. There are great resources out there for you to find images. I listed a couple of my favorite ones, and we're gonna go on to the next, maybe, the next tip. So my next tip is if you are going to show a chart or a graph, think about whether you can pull the data from the graph that you're showing. The reason I say this is because I think in just about every professional presentation I have been a participant in, if the presenter is showing a graph or a chart on the slide, they always preface it with, I know you can't see or read anything up here. So let me just break it down for you and interpret the, the data and just say it. Um, and my general feeling on this is if, you're, if you know people can't actually read what's on the slide, maybe just think about pulling the statistics or the numbers from that and placing it on your slide in a way that's more impactful. Because quite frankly, I'm not going to remember all of these different, you know, bars or charts or numbers or anything. But what I will remember is a, a single, a single number that's really impactful. And, and one example is um, Pew Research Center, because I do a lot of, of programming around um, social media use. Um, Pew Research has some really, really great um, research studies on the use of social media across different demographics. And I could very easily um, just pull a, a chart or graph that shows all of these different bars and these little itty bitty numbers about who's using what social media demographic, or I can just pull the data and say X percentage of people are using Facebook. And I think the number now is like 79% of people, online American adults, use Facebook. That is memorable. That is way more memorable than showing a chart with itty bitty text that nobody can read. So that is one, one more simple tip that I have. The other thing that you can do is think about maybe recreating that graph. So in PowerPoint, um, if you go to the uh, like graphs tab, you can just insert a chart. So maybe you want to pull like three numbers and put it in your own little bar graph. It'll open up an Excel file. You can input your, your data into that Excel file and it will automatically create a graph in your PowerPoint presentation. So think about how you can play with, with those numbers to be really more impactful. Any questions from anybody so far? Sometimes I get carried away with just talking a lot. So I do want you guys to feel free. You should be including images of these no-nos. Oh, like what not to do? That's a good point. Yeah, before and after, like, don't do this, but do this instead. That, that's really good advice. I appreciate that, Vince. So the next tip that I have is playing with typography. Typography, a lot of people might just say, why don't you just use the word font? This is going to be a little bit technical. Some of the descriptions that I'm going to use, it's going to get a little bit technical in terms of like how we think about graphic design. Um, we tend to use the word font to describe you know what our words look like or what our text looks like right um in reality what we what the more appropriate word to use would be typeface or font family so an example would be arial arial is actually a typeface or a font family within that typeface we have a couple different individual fonts we have arial regular we have arial bold we have arial italicized and i think arial bold italicized so you have four individual fonts within that font family and you're probably thinking, who cares? Why is this, why is this really important to bring up? Um, and it's important to bring up because if you, if you have certain limitations with which you have to work because of your university branding, um, typography um, and the individual fonts that you use can be a really fun way to just make your presentation pop. 
Um, here at Ohio State, we have two university approved fonts. We have our sans serif font. Um, sans serif means like without the little feet or sort of the little decorative designs on the end. Um, and then we have our serif font, which has the, the little feet. Arial would be an example of a sans serif font. Times New Roman would be an example of a serif font. Um, and those are actually our two default fonts if you don't want to pay the licensing fee to buy our official approved university fonts. Here's the difference between though buying, spending the $95 on our university approved fonts and just using the default of Arial. So our, our university sans serif font is called Proxima Nova. And within that, I think there's a Proxima Nova, like regular, and then there's a Proxima Nova condensed, which is just a little bit of a narrow, narrower font. You have 28 different individual fonts within that font family to play with. 28 different options to play with versus our default of Arial, which only has four. So it's incredibly limiting. Um, and when we get into PowerPoint to play around, I can show you what that looks like. So here, I'm using Proxima Nova on this slide. The words play with, I think, is the lightest or um, um, lightest weighted font, if that makes sense. Um, and then the typography is one of the more heavier weighted fonts within that font family. If you do this same thing with Arial, you, you can barely notice the difference between Arial Regular and Arial Bold. It's just not as, as striking of a difference. So that's why typography can be um, really fun to play around with. If you do happen to have a university font that, that you know you're supposed to be using, chances are you do have a, an extended font um, family. So there's a lot of different options in that that you can use. If not, there are, um, and I almost hesitate to say this because I don't wanna just like give you permission, like go willy nilly find you know, a font that you like and just start using it. It's really important to be following those brand guidelines. But if for some reason you don't have like a font that you have to use, um, there are websites online where you can download free fonts. Um, font Squirrel is one of my favorite websites. Some of them are not allowed to be used for commercial purposes, so you do have to be aware of, of some of those policies. Um, other ones you, you are free to use for commercial and non-commercial purposes, and they have sometimes a lot of, of different fonts um, available within a font family. So any questions about typography or, or playing with different fonts? I think that was probably the most technical I'll get in terms of like terminology. So the next thing I will mention is the ability to create a roadmap in your, um, in your presentation. I've created a roadmap here because it made sense to do so. I was giving you seven um, tips for great slide design. Um, so I created a roadmap so you knew exactly um, what tip that we were on. And um, somebody asked, what should we not use? Um, in, terms of, in terms of fonts that you should not use, I, I don't have a good recommendation for that because I think it's gonna come down to what your university wants. I will say, generally speaking, sans serif fonts, so the fonts without the like, curly feet or whatever, um, those, are, those tend to be more legible, research tends to show. Um, that they tend to be um, more legible, but there's there's varying views on that. Somebody else um, said I would recommend if you download a new font, and we will talk about this. This will be one of my tips um, at the very end. Um, if you are downloading a, a font and using a font that is not going to be installed on the machine on which you will be presenting, that can be a problem. I will come back to that, and I will I will talk about that. So creating a roadmap. So what I've done here, I will show you exactly how you can do this. Um, somebody asked, where did you find your template? This is, not a, this is not a template. This is something that I just created in PowerPoint, and I will show you exactly how to, to do this. It's very easy. I know it might seem like, oh, that, that was probably hard and tedious. It's really not. I will show you exactly how to do this. Creating a roadmap is nice because it gives people sort of an outline of, of where you are and where you're going and how long you have left, which can just be, I think, mentally kind of nice to know. Um, as a as a session participant when you're when you're looking at a PowerPoint presentation and it's really easy to do creating a roadmap might not make sense for your individual presentation it does however make a lot of sense if you are going to list tips or tricks or um, when I was a county educator my area of specialization was invasive plants so I often was giving presentations on like the top 10 invasive plants in Ohio um, so I could have created a roadmap that was really nice instead I was creating these really horrible slides with bulleted text, right? That's, that's what I was doing. So I, I would love to like recreate some of those PowerPoints um, using some of, of these tips and tricks. 
So creating a roadmap can be fun. It can be a little bit creative. And I will show you exactly how, how to do that here in a little bit. I'm going to check my time. Okay. Last tip. This one. A little bit hard, I think. Get creative. A lot of people say, what does that mean? You know, if, if I'm so accustomed to working from a template, how do I actually get creative? How can I get into a PowerPoint presentation and just think entirely different? Um, then, I, then I'm accustomed to thinking. And I think the number one thing that you can do is go online and do a, a Google search for great slide decks and just start looking at examples. What do you like about those? What do you not like about those? What can you adapt? Um, what can you take and, and make work well with your university brand guidelines? Um, and, and just start collecting inspiration from elsewhere. And then start with a blank slate. That is, I think, my biggest tip that I can give you is if you're really working from a, a template, it can be sometimes hard to break away from that template um, to really start to get creative. So think about how you can open PowerPoint, completely white slide, blank, no text boxes, no, no branding. Just think about how you can start fresh. And then consider, again, going back to our very first tip, consider what is it that I actually have to do in order to be brand compliant and then work from there. So that, that's sort of my creative um, method when I, when I start with a new presentation. So those are my like super simple seven tips um, for great slide design. I'm gonna open it up for questions and then I'm going to get into PowerPoint and start to show you some things that will hopefully be helpful for putting all of this together. So what questions do you all have for me? What's your take on animation? <laughs> um, I think the general rule of thumb that I tend to see when I look at best practices for uh, PowerPoint presentations is that you should not use animation. Um, if you do, it has to be done really, really well, and there has to be an explicit purpose for it. So don't animate something. Don't have like an animation um, on your slides unless there is like a really good reason to do it. Um, Any more, sometimes I see I see like some conferences say like you cannot have animations in your presentation. Just don't do it. So you do have to take a look at, at what the rules are for the individual presentation that you're giving and whether there's parameters that you have to work um, within for that. Um, somebody else asked about videos. Videos are great. Videos are a really fantastic thing. Um, you do have to be careful with how you're using the video. If you embed the video directly into the PowerPoint presentation, then you can move that file from like one one computer to the next and not lose it. Um, if you are creating like a, a path to that video, then you have to make sure that that video is like on the flash drive that you're, you're, that you're taking to a new computer. Um, somebody else asked about transitions. Transitions, again, keep them simple. There are lots of different transitions that um, PowerPoint can do. Some of them are really tacky. Some of them aren't. So the transitions that I have between slides, or I think it's the dissolve transition. It's just real simple, real smooth. Um, my recommendation would just be to keep it simple. Somebody else asked about text color choice and ADA compliance and how important is this for PowerPoint. This is a really, really important point to bring up. Um, and it, it's something that we should all be considering. Um, and as I think about this, this presentation that I just gave here today using red, because right, that's our, our scarlet for Ohio State. Um, and yet some people have like red, green color blindness. So how does that affect them? Um, I don't have a good answer for that right off the top of my head. Um, I will say it's important to create um, presentations that have high contrast between like your text or the, the backgrounds um, so that, that they are legible. Um, this is something I'm going to have to look a little bit more into because it, it's something that we should all be um, aware of. I will share a really quick story here as I get out of, um, I get out of PowerPoint. I used to work, um, I used to work as a program coordinator for Ohio State, like before my, my time in extension. And I worked for somebody who I developed presentations for and every presentation I, I designed, I had to, it was his, his rule. I had to have a blue background, bright blue, royal blue with yellow text. That was just the parameters that I was given for every single um, presentation that I had to design. I would not recommend doing something like that. I would recommend keeping color um, simple and making sure that it, it's high contrast. So hopefully that answers your question. This is something I will have to look a little bit more into as well. 
So rules of thumbs for using uh, clip art versus um, clip art for adult audiences versus youth audience. This is a good question. Again, I would almost say it, it's really probably up to up to the individual context in which you're presenting clip art. Um, it can be fun for youth. Um, it, it's going to have to be a, just a, a personal call on that. So and maybe other people want to weigh in. If, if it's youth, maybe it's more appropriate. Um, if you're dealing with, you know, high school students or older middle school students, maybe not so much, but it could be fun for, you know, for younger, younger kids. So can everybody see my, my PowerPoint still? You're just seeing like my PowerPoint window with a blank slide. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So we are going to open up, um, I'm going to delete out of some of these text boxes. So I'm still trying to watch the text, um, or the, the chat box here. So I want to show you just a little bit about how easy it is to really get into PowerPoint and create a, a fantastic looking slide. So one of the first things that I would do is obviously I would have like the content in mind that I'm going to share, right? So what text needs to be on this slide? Um, and then I would find an image. So I'm going to show you just how easy it is to go to, and now you probably can't see this. I'm going to share my desktop instead. So you should see my internet browser. I'm going to go to stocksnap.io and I'm going to search for, can somebody just give me a real quick keyword for an image that I can search for? Dogs. Let's see what we, I'm just going to do dogs. Okay. Really, really important to, to recognize this. This is true on pretty much any free stock image site. The first few rows of images you'll see are all branded with Shutterstock. If I clicked any one of these, it's going to redirect me to Shutterstock's website and I'm going to have to pay for that image. Here's the thing. The first few rows of images are going to be the highest quality. I mean, look at this picture of this puppy. Who would not want to use this, right? They are the highest quality images that you will find. They do this on purpose because they want to, they want to trick you into thinking, oh, I can use this. So you click it and then it's going to take you to a new website and it's going to say, oh, sorry, you have to pay you know, $40 to use this image, whatever the fee might be. So here's a few other images of puppies that we can use. This almost looks like a fox, maybe. So you can scroll through here, you can choose one here. Oh, look at this really cute picture of a, a puppy celebrating his birthday. I'm going to just hit free download. So you can see how simple this is. Free download, it saves into my downloads, pops it up in preview. Wonderful. I love it. So I'm going to pull this image from my downloads into my slide. And now you'll see here, it doesn't take up the entire slide, right? I have this, this white bar. So if you want to make sure that it takes up the entire slide, all you have to do is drag it, make it a little bit bigger. And then the other thing I like to do, it's a personal preference, is I'm going to crop this image because right now I'm not seeing the actual boundaries of my slide. I'm seeing the entire image. And the top of my slide ends right about here. I want to be able to see that. So I'm going to go to my format picture tab on the top of the screen and I'm going to click crop. And this is going to give me some cropping guidelines. So I'm going to just crop this image from here. I can move the image around so that I know exactly what I'm seeing within that cropped boundary. Hopefully that makes sense. So here's an image of a puppy on a slide. Now, all of the images that I use over here are grayscale because I wanted to be able to overlay text on top of that. In this case, I have some really nice blank space that I could put text without having to make this image grayscale. But if you do want to change the, the filter of this image and you just want to really quickly make a grayscale image, if you go into your format picture tab again, um, you have some different editing options for that image. You have different correct corrective options. Um, you also have a recolor option, and I can turn this grayscale just as easily as that. The one that I actually use, though, is this lighter grayscale one down here, because that way I can actually put text on top of it, and it's going to look um, a little bit better. So now if I want to put text over top of this, I'm just going to do insert text box, and we're going to say happy birthday, puppy. I can change the font, I can make it bigger, super simple. Um, and let's say I want this text to be 
Okay, so I'm gonna show you how to, how to change the text to something very specific. So let's say you want this text to be Ohio State University scarlet color. How do you do that? So you copy that, that text that you wanna change the color, go to your font color window, and go down to more colors. And you have a couple different options here. So you'll see that there's different tabbed options. The other thing I wanna mention here, which is really important that I haven't mentioned, is I am using PowerPoint for Mac 2011. So the interface for your PowerPoint, if you're on a different version of, of Mac PowerPoint or if you're on PC, it's gonna look a little bit different. Most, if not all of these options should still exist for you, but just recognize that. So if you're in your, your color options here, um, you go to the, the color wheel, you can pick and choose. I could say, you know what, I'm gonna just try to get close to that scarlet color and just you know hope it works but you want it to be more exact, right? So there's two different ways that I'm gonna show you how to do that. You have an eyedropper tool that you can pick up and you can hover over anywhere on your computer screen. And hopefully you guys are still all seeing this, right? I'm gonna open up the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna use my eyedropper tool. I'm gonna to hover over this scarlet color here and I'm gonna hope that that is just good enough. The other option, if you want to know that this scarlet is exact, I'm going to go back to my format text, back into more colors, and I'm going to go to this RGB sliders. And notice how the color code, RGB, R is for red, G is for green, B is for blue, um, it's giving me the color code 18704. In reality, I know that our scarlet color is actually 18700. So it's not going to be exact. Most people would never be able to tell the difference, but to get that exact, you can actually put in your RGB color codes. So now I have a slide that says happy birthday puppy. If I want this, this text to just look a little bit more pizzazzy, if that's a word, pizzazzy, um, I can go to, so I'm going to go to home. I'm going to go to, where am I going to go? Format, the format tab, and I'm going to go to effects. I'm gonna click that and I'm gonna add just a background shadow and it's just gonna make that text pop a little bit out. I think I did this on my very first slide. Yeah, I have a shadow on the, the title for my very first slide. So one really simple thing that you can do um, to, add, to add the text. So any questions there? The other thing I want to show you is how to create a really simple roadmap just using insert shapes. Um, so the roadmap that I created, I'll kind of recreate that for you here. I'm going to go up to inserts along the, the top menu bar and I'm going to go down to shape and I'm going to insert just a simple square. Now in my version of PowerPoint, when I insert any shape, it automatically inserts as a gradient blue color with a line and a shadow. So the very first thing I do is I go to my format tab, I go to line and click no line and then effects, shadow and no shadow. And if I want this to be my scarlet color, it's already here in recent color. So I could just choose one of those or I can go to more colors and do 18700, my color code for scarlet. And there I have it. Now I just want this to be a rectangle. So I'm simply going to make it a rectangle. You can just pull those sides for however large you want it to be. Um, here on my roadmap, I have little triangles. You could do circles, you could do you know, little squares, you can do whatever you want. I'm going to go ahead and just insert um, a triangle again, and I can show you how easy that is. I'm going to turn this around. Now, if you, if you just try to turn this, you notice how you might not get like super exact and it's it's sort of um it's locking in the 90 degree angle which is nice but if if you also just want to be able to turn it um a little bit easier you can click down your shift key and that's going to allow you to turn it completely at 90 degrees and then i'm going to put it over by my red bar now this doesn't look great right because it inserted it with that blue gradient with a line and a shadow so i'm going to go back and do no line no shadow and change it to my red color. And you can play with you know, what size you want to do. So now I have the, the general template. If you hold down, now this is a keyboard shortcut on Macs. Um, it should be similar, I think, for PCs. It might be the command key instead of the option key. On a Mac, if you hold down option and then 
hover over what shape you want to duplicate, you can just click and drag it and simply duplicate that over and over and over um, until you have that. I would go through and resize this so that those, what, seven shapes all fall within the, um, the boundary of my slide so it looks a little bit better. This just gives you a sense of how easy it is to do that. Um, next, I need my numbers for my numbered slides. So I'm gonna go to insert text box and I'm just gonna insert a slide with a number one. I would change the, the font to something that I actually want. Here, I'm not gonna take the time to do that, but I am going to go to fonts and change the color and then I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger, center justify it, and then get that into a position that looks a little bit more appropriate. In the same way that I duplicated all of those individual triangles, you can just copy or um, hold down the option or command key and then just drag and drop this over and over. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Over and over and over. And then you can go through and change all of those numbers to be one through seven instead of them all being one. I would go through and take the time to make sure that these are all appropriately aligned. Um, the reason why I do all of this on one slide is because now I have a template for the rest of my entire uh, slide deck. Um, and I make sure that everything looks identical. So from slide to slide, when you go through, it just looks like you're moving down. If one of these just is, does not happen to be in the same alignment, it's gonna kind of throw off the, the flow of that. So I would just simply duplicate this slide. If you hit Command D, you can duplicate this slide. And then I would keep one slide for my template and then go to the next slide and I would actually delete all of these elements. And that would be slide number one. And then I'm going to duplicate this slide again. I'm gonna do the same thing, except I'm gonna delete everything. But slide number two, for some reason this is stuck and it's not working. So I would delete everything except this one. This would say number two and I would go through and do my whole slide like that. So it's really easy to create that roadmap and you don't have to do this along the left hand side. You can do it on the right. You can do it along the top. You can do whatever you want, um, whatever you want to do. So just a few more things I want to share here. I'm going to copy and paste this slide. I'm going to delete all of these elements. Um, I had the awesome opportunity to attend DevLearn and the Adobe Summit back in October. And somebody from Adobe presented this really just amazingly beautiful slide deck. And I remember just looking at them thinking, holy cow, that is beautiful. How can I, how can I replicate that same style? And the slides were all very simple. It was just a, a picture with this gorgeous, like pastel gradient, gradient of, of color across the, the picture and then some very simple text. And I wanted to know how do I do that? So I, I thought, what's the best way to do that? So we have our image here um, to start with. If you wanted to put this really cool, just gradient of color across it, you can do that very, very easily. I'm going to insert a shape, just a, a simple rectangle here. I'm going to cover my entire slide with it. Again, I've already said this a few times, I'm gonna go back and do no line and no shadow. And then I'm going to go to fill. So again, I'm in my format tab. I'm gonna to go to fill, fill effects, and then I'm going to click gradient. And here I see that, that light blue to darker blue gradient. You can add colors, you can delete colors, you can change colors. So I'm going to add a third color if you hover over any one of these little arrow, arrows, you can, I don't know why that just got out of that. If you hover over any one of those arrows, you can change the color. So I'm gonna change this to like a nice pastel. I kind of like the way that looks. You can change the angle of this. So now I have a nice pastel gradient, but you can't see the picture underneath, right? So what do you do? you simply change the transparency of this, and now you have this image over top. But guess what, the image isn't coming through very well. And the reason for that is if I go to reorder overlapping objects, that was just a right click and you can reorder objects. This is, I believe, a feature, um, this interface right here that's just on Macs. Um, so you might not have the same interface on a PC, but you do have the option to just reorder objects. You can send objects backwards, bring objects in front of others, if you remember this picture, I 
put at this very light grayscale. So I'm gonna change it back to a more bold grayscale color. I'm gonna send it all the way back behind this pastel gradient. And now I have this really beautiful gradient of color over it. And if you pop that up on the, the big screen, the colors aren't super bold, so you could play with that. You could have much brighter, um, bigger colors. So that's, that's one thing that you could do. I would probably also change this text color maybe to white so that it just flows a little bit better. So for those of you who are at NAEP SDP um, and saw my Ignite session, you probably remember all of my slides looked um, similar to this. That's how I did it. it it's very, very easy. Um, the reason why I showed you some of these things here today is just to get you thinking a little bit differently about how you can use PowerPoint. PowerPoint is an incredibly robust and amazing tool that you can use. Um, and all you have to do is some really, really simple, quick things and you can create really awesome um, presentations. Two more tips that I'm gonna recommend. If you are giving a presentation, you have a PowerPoint slide deck behind you, you're face-to-face -face giving a presentation, even if you're doing a webinar like this, um, and you have something like a, a really awesome story to tell and you don't want people to be looking at your slide. You want people just to be focused on you. Um, a lot of slide remotes like uh, advancers, clickers have a button that if you click, it will make your slide go black. You could use that option. Um, the other thing you could do is just put a black slide in your presentation. And this will give you, um, it will give you almost like a reminder, like, oh yeah, like here's time for a story, it's the black slide. Um, and it will, it will also just create no distraction for your audience. So they will be all eyes focused on, on you. So that's one other tip. And then somebody mentioned the point of, if you um, happen to have like university fonts that you have to use or a special font that is installed on your computer, but you have to you have to put your presentation on somebody else's computer to present. What do you do? How many times have you been in a situation before where you get your you know you create this amazing presentation? It looks so beautiful, and then you get it on somebody else's computer, and all your fonts change, and your alignment changes, and everything just looks like oh my gosh, I spent all that time and energy, and nothing is where it's supposed to be. That's really really disappointing. So with a PC. There is an option, and because I'm on a Mac, I, I can't show you this, but if you, if you Google it, it should be pretty easy to find and follow those instructions. There is a way to embed your fonts in your presentation so that um, they won't get changed if you switch computers. The other option that you have on Mac or a PC is if you go to save your presentation, you go to File, Save as Pictures, and I have this option to, to go and look at more options. You can ensure that your slide deck, your slide size is accurate, um, and you have the option to save the current slide only that you happen to be on, or you can save every single slide in that slide deck. And if I hit OK, it's going to create a brand new folder on my desktop that's gonna appear, and all of my slides will be saved now as individual JPEG images. So the, the final thing that you have to do is just pull those images into a PowerPoint slide by slide, but that ensures that your text is going to be saved um, and your slides will look great. The issue with that is if you do have animations, like if you have like text sliding in, all of those are gonna be lost because all of your individual elements are now um, flattened and they're single elements on your slide. So that's something to keep in mind. It's also really important to only do that as a very, very last step because you won't be able to then go back and edit. You have to go back to your original file, edit it, and then resave that slide as an image and then pull it into your new, your new slide. So that, that is all of my tips and tricks that I have for you today. <clears throat> so Vince asked questions about, like, can you use the, the master to make elements like a gradient consistent throughout the presentation? Um, yeah, you should be able, you should be able to, uh, to do something like that. Um, I don't have time to go into using the, the master um, to create a template, but you could. The thing that I did with my presentation is rather than having every slide have the exact same gradient, um, I just, I copied and pasted that same gradient over every slide and then went into the fill option and filled it with completely different colors. So every slide had a different gradient of, of colors available. So Rich has Today there was a there was a question earlier. I'm sorry that from Rich asking about rules of fonts or clip art different for adult audiences versus youth audiences. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mentioned earlier. I, I think that's going to be highly dependent on um, on the individual audience and the context. So what is it that your your 
What is it that you want to use? I would say yes. Um, generally speaking, clip art is probably more um, appropriate for youth than a adults, but again, it just really depends on the, the context. All right, I see it. Um, there's a really good blog conversation. We are right at four o'clock now, so I would encourage you to just get creative. Um, somebody asked if there was a recording. I do believe there will be a recording for this, yes. Um, and NAEP SDP will be hopefully giving us information. Yes. So feel free to reach out to me with questions um, and get into PowerPoint and get creative. You can't break it. So just get in there and, and start start learning and start playing around. All Thank right. You Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, if you'll notice in the chat box, there is a link to a very, very brief four question survey. If you all would take some time to just click on that and let us know what you liked what could have been a little bit different and what topics you might want to see if you want to join us for another NAAP SDP webinar in the future. So Danae, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Some people from the survey as well. It's not working. Let me, let me check on that link and, and I'll try it again. Sorry. All right, guys. Thank you so much, everybody.